Praise the Lord. I'm so honored to be sharing God's word with you once again. Um, let's pray before we go ahead. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to be able to go through your word, how I pray that you speak to our hearts. Amen. We are looking at the theme, a God who is all present. I know that we've been going through the book of Acts. And this book of Acts, if it was a movie, I believe that it would be categorized as an action-packed movie. Because it's a book that is filled with a lot of actions. And we see the main character behind the actions that we see in the book of Acts is the Holy Spirit. We see in chapter 2, um, the Holy Spirit descending on the disciples in forms or in tongues of fire. And they're speaking in tongues. And 3,000 people are joining the congregation or the disciples. We see in chapter 3 that they are healing the crippled man. And, and we see in chapter 4 that their works are leading them to prison, to being persecuted and flogged and caned. In chapter 5, we see Ananias and Sapphira lying to the Holy Spirit. And they are struck dead right there before the, the, the believers. In chapter 6, we see that there is a confusion that is arising between the Hebrew and, and the Hellenist Jews because they are saying that food was not being evenly distributed. And so the apostles are saying, choose amongst you seven people who are filled with the Holy Spirit and wisdom to serve at tables. But for us, we will concentrate in, in the work of, 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 of the word, of preaching and prayer. And we see that in the list of the people that are talked about, the seven, was a man called Stephen. And then and in this man, they give a slight profile about Stephen among us all the seven. And they're saying that uh, in, in verse 5, that Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And you continue on in verse 8, and they say that Stephen, full of grace and power, and was doing great wonders and signs among the believers. And so we see that because this man was filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with wisdom, filled with grace and power, some people would not withstand the power of God that was working in him. And so they are standing to, to have a dispute with him and they can't win him. And so they get um, false witnesses who came up with false accusations against him. So what were the accusations against Stephen? We see in verse 11, uh, 11 and 12, that the accusations were that he was speaking against Moses and God, that he was speaking against the temple, the holy place, that's how they called it, and, and the, the customs that Moses had handed over to them. So for them, it was so dear to them, for one to speak against the temple and the law was tantamount to even treason, to even killing you. So at this point, these are the false accusations they are putting against Stephen. The same accusations that we see being put on Jesus Christ, they're saying that he was, had said that he was going to break down the, the temple in three days and build it up again. That's why he's sent to the cross. Um, and we see that why is this very important to them? Because the temple to them had the holy place and the most holy place. And this is where God met the Israelites. So for you to speak against the temple is speaking against the holy place where God met them. But also the law, this is what God gave to Moses and he gave it to the Israelites. So they held it so dear that for one to speak against these two was very, very big. And so in chapter 7, we start off with Stephen trying to give his defense. Remember we said that our theme is a God or the God who is all present. So in his defense, Stephen is explaining something about a God who is all present. And first of all, we see that as he explains that, he gives a discourse, he gives a summary of almost the whole Old Testament. Which is a question to you and I. How many of us can summarize the whole Bible, or at least the New Testament, or at least the Old Testament? But this man was able to summarize it because he had spent some time in the presence of the Lord. No wonder the last verse of chapter 6 tells us that the council saw his face and it was like a face of an angel. When um, Moses spent time in the presence of the Lord. We see that in Exodus 34, 35, that he came and his face was shining. And we see that he has spent 40 days and 40 nights in the presence of the Lord. He even covered himself with a veil. You can just imagine. Because he had spent time in the presence of the Lord. If you and I can spend time in God's word, 
Surely the glory of God will shine through our lives. We will be a light wherever God is blessing us. This man is able to do this because he had spent time in the presence of the Lord. And so he's telling them something about the presence of the Lord. That first of all, this God who is all present is a God who, missed, who meets us even in the worst of places. This God meets us in the worst of places. In verse 2, he starts his defense and says, Brothers and fathers, hear me, because he's telling them, you are accusing me, but we are actually brothers. You are actually my fathers. And he says that the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. Do you know something about Mesopotamia? This was a place that was filled with a lot of idol worship. This was a place that wasn't worthy. But we are seeing that the God of glory appears to Abraham in such a place. Can you imagine? It's God taking the initiative and appearing to Abraham. If God has appeared to you, if God has given you salvation, it is him who takes the initiative. That even when he sends his only begotten son, where is he born? We see him born in a manger. Can you imagine? Worst of places. Not in the best hospital in Bethlehem at the time. We see that when Jesus Christ is calling some of his disciples, Matthew, he meets him at, at his tax collector's booth. And we see that the tax collectors in that, in that time were the riffraff of society. But God, Jesus meets Matthew in a tax collector's booth. When he goes to, to call um, the other disciples, Peter, John and James, he meets them at, at the shores of the lake while they were fishing. A place I believe was filthy, smelling fish and dirty. But this is where Jesus meets them. When he calls Zacchaeus, he was in a sycamore tree and he goes and meets with him in his house. And they're even accusing him of meeting with prostitutes and tax collectors. We serve a God who is all present, who meets us in the worst of places. I don't know what place you are living in, but God is ready to meet you wherever you are. If you hear his voice today, please don't harden your heart. We see that secondly, this God who is all present, that we approach his presence by faith. That he continues to explain to them in his discourse, in his defense, and talks about Abraham. He talks about how God calls Abraham from Mesopotamia and sends him to Canaan, where he didn't even have land where to set his foot. But this man embraces the promises of God. Just because he had faith, you read Romans chapter 4 verse 3 and it says that by, by, because he believed God, it was counted to him as righteousness. That we approach the presence of God by faith. Just like Abraham, it was by faith. It is even before even the law was given. And remember they're accusing him of speaking against the law, of speaking against the holy place, the temple. But he's telling them, look, even Abraham, God appeared to him even before the law was given through Moses. That it's not about what you do for you to get into the presence of God. It's about what God has done. That you are saved by grace through faith, not by works so that any man must boast. We are saved by faith alone to do good works. We are saved for good works, not saved by works alone. We are saved by faith alone. So I'm here to let you know that the God we serve is all present, present in the worst of places. His, we approach his presence by faith. So if you're here and you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, how I pray that you will. I pray that you will take that step and you will enjoy his presence. Thirdly, we see that this God who is all present meets us even in the worst of situations. Stephen goes on to give his defense. He talks about Abraham. He talks about Isaac. He talks about Jacob and the 12 patriarchs. He talks about how the patriarchs hated Joseph and they even sold him to captivity. When you read verse 9, it says, And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him out of, hell of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, the king of, of Egypt. And we see that at this point, Joseph is going through afflictions, the worst of situations. But even in that moment, God was present with him. You continue on and he talks about how they settled in Egypt, how uh, a new pharaoh, pharaoh comes up who doesn't know about the Israelites. And when he wanted to kill all the, first, all the boys that were born to the Israelites, we see that because God was present in the life of Moses, that Moses is adopted by the daughter of Pharaoh, and he grows up in a palace. Can you just imagine that you are growing up as a grandson of your oppressor, 
that Pharaoh who wanted to kill the Israelites, wanted to kill the Israelite boys, that Moses, an Israelite, is growing up under his roof. Can you just imagine? This is not because of the mother of Moses, but it is because God was present even in the worst of those situations. Later on, we see that the Israelites cry to the Lord. And what happens? Because God was present, he sends, them, he sends Moses, who delivers them from the captivity they were in. We serve a God who is all present. Present in the worst of situations. We approach his presence by faith. Present even in the worst of places. Fourth, we see, the fourth point, we see that this God who is all present cannot be limited by just a place, cannot be limited by a building. We see that he meets Moses when he was in the wilderness. He meets him in a burning bush. He tells him, get off your sandals because the ground you stand on is holy. And remember they're accusing Stephen because of his speaking against the holy place. But they're forgetting that God met Moses in a wilderness, in a burning bush, and he calls that holy ground. Can you imagine? We see later on that David wants to build the house of God. And we see that Solomon is the one who is given the, 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 the blessing to do that, the grace to do that. That even when he builds that, in chapter 7, um, verses 48 is saying that, Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands. That even when he built it, yes, he had chosen to, to meet them there, but that's not where he dwells. We live in a generation where we limit God to be met in a certain church building, in a certain fellowship, in a certain place. But I'm here to tell you that we serve a God who is all present. Yes, you can meet him in your church building. Yes, you can meet him in your house. You can meet him wherever it is because he's not limited by a building or a place. He is all present. Lastly, we see that this God that we serve is all present and we meet him in the Lord Jesus Christ. We see that he speaks about Moses and he says that this Moses said, this is a Moses who said to the Israelites that God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. How was Moses a prophet? Um, how was Jesus a prophet like Moses? They say in verse 30, 35, he says, This man God sent as both a ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. That God is sending Moses as a redeemer. And we see that Jesus is a prophet like Moses because he comes to redeem us, to take us out of the captivity of sin and bring us to the rest of eternal life. So we see that these people are speaking about Moses. They're speaking about a God they don't understand well. They're speaking about Moses, but they forget that even Moses is speaking about Jesus Christ. And so I'm here to let you know that we meet God in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he's the visible image of the invisible God. But today, people are running to certain men of God as if um, others are men of the devil. Can you imagine that? We are all men of God if you have believed Jesus Christ. You are a man of God. You are a woman of God. You are a daughter of God. You are a son of God. To as many as believed him, he gave a right to become children of God. So we don't meet God in a man. We don't meet God in the so-called apostles, in the so-called prophets. We meet him in the Lord Jesus Christ. Moses is also pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ, a prophet like him. As I conclude, I don't know what you're going through, but I'm here to encourage you that we serve the God who is all present. Who miss you in the worst of situations? Who miss you in the worst of places? Whom you can approach his presence by faith? Whom you can approach through the Lord Jesus Christ? May the Lord bless you. <music>